The Pomegranate Seeds, Part 5, from the Tanglewood Tales. Being acquainted with Mother Ceres, he answered her question as civilly as he knew how, and invited her to taste some milk and honey out of a wooden bowl. But neither could Pan tell her what had become of Persephone any better than the rest of these wild people. Thus Mother Ceres went wandering about for nine long days and nights, finding no trace of Persephone, unless it were now and then a withered flower. And these she picked up and put in her bosom, because she fancied that they might have fallen from her poor child's hand. All day she traveled onward through the hot sun, and at night again the flame of the torch would redden and gleam along the pathway, and she continued her search by its light without ever sitting down to rest. On the tenth day, she chanced to espy the mouth of a cavern, within which, though it was bright noon everywhere else, there would have been only a dusky twilight. But it so happened that a torch was burning there. It flickered and struggled with the darkness, but could not half light up the gloomy cavern with all its melancholy glimmer. Ceres was resolved to leave no spot without a search, so she peeped into the entrance of the cave and lighted up a little more by holding her own torch before her. In so doing, she caught a glimpse of what seemed to be a woman sitting on the brown leaves of the last autumn, a great heap of which had been swept into the cave by the wind. This woman, if woman it were, was by no means so beautiful as many of her sex, for her head, they tell me, was shaped very much like a dog's, and, by way of ornament, she wore a wreath of snakes around it. But Mother Ceres, the moment she saw her, knew that this was an odd kind of person, who put all of her enjoyment in being miserable, and never would have a word to say to other people, unless they were as melancholy and wretched as she herself delighted to be. I am wretched enough now, thought poor Ceres, to talk with this melancholy Hecate, were she ten times sadder, than ever she was yet. So she stepped into the cave and sat down on the withered leaves by the dog-headed woman's side. In all the world, since her daughter's lost, she found no other companion. Oh, Hecate, said she, if ever you lose a daughter, you will know what sorrow is. Tell me for pity's sake, have you seen my poor child Persephone pass by the mouth of your cavern? No, answered Hecate in a cracked voice and sighing betwixt every word or two. No, Mother Ceres, I have seen nothing of your daughter, but my ears, you must know, are made in such a way that all cries of distress and of fright all over the world are pretty sure to find their way to them. And nine days ago, as I sat in my cave, making myself very miserable, I heard the voice of a young girl shrieking as if in great distress. Something terrible has happened to the child, you may rest assured. As well as I could judge, a dragon or some other cruel monster was carrying her away. <sighs> you kill me by saying so, cried Ceres, almost ready to faint. Where was the sound, and which way did it seem to go? It passed very swiftly along, <sighs> said Hecate, and at the same time, there was a heavy rumbling of wheels toward the eastward. <sighs> I can tell you nothing more except that, in my honest opinion, you will never see your daughter again. <sighs> the best advice I can give you is to take up your abode in this cavern, where we will be the two most wretched women in the world. Ah. <sighs> Not yet, dark Hecate, replied Ceres, but do you first come with your torch and help me to seek for my lost child. And when there shall be no more hope of finding her, if that black day is ordained to come, then if you will give me room to fling myself down, either on these withered leaves or on the naked rock, 
I will show you what it is to be miserable. But until I know that she has perished from the face of the earth, I will not allow myself space even to grieve. The dismal Hecate did not much like the idea of going abroad into the sunny world, but then she reflected that the sorrow of the disconsolate Ceres would be like a gloomy twilight round them both, let the sun shine ever so brightly, and that therefore she might enjoy her bad spirits quite as well as if she were to stay in the cave. So she finally consented to go, and they set out together, both carrying torches, although it was broad daylight and clear sunshine. The torchlight seemed to make a gloom so that the people who they met along the road could not very distinctly see their figures. And indeed, if they once caught a glimpse of Hecate with the wreath of snakes around her forehead, they generally thought it prudent to run away without waiting for a second glance. As the pair traveled along in this woebegone matter, a thought struck Ceres. There is one person, she exclaimed, who must have seen my poor child and can doubtless tell what has become of her. Why did not I think of him before? It is Phoebus. What? said Hecate. The young man always sits in the sunshine. Oh, oh pray, do not think of going near him. Oh, he is a gay, light, frivolous young fellow oh, and will only smile in your face. And besides, there is such a glare of the sun about him that he will quite blind my poor eyes, oh, which I have almost wept away already. You have promised to be my companion, answered Ceres. Come, let us make haste, or the sunshine will be gone, and Phoebus along with it. Accordingly, they went along in quest of Phoebus, both of them, slightly grievously, and Hecate, to say the truth, making a great deal worse lamentations than Ceres. For all the pleasure she had, you know, lay in being miserable, and therefore she made the most of it. By and by, after a pretty long journey, they arrived at the sunniest spot in the whole world. There they beheld a beautiful young man with long curling ringlets, which seemed to be made of golden sunbeams. His garments were like summer clouds, and the expression of his face was so exceedingly vivid that Hecate held her hands before her eyes, muttering that he ought to wear a black veil. Phoebus, for this was the very person whom they were seeking, had a lyre in his hands, and was making its chords tremble with sweet music, at the same time singing a most exquisite song which he had recently composed. For besides a great many other accomplishments, this young man was renowned for his admirable poetry. As Ceres and her dismal companion approached him, Phoebus smiled on them so cheerfully that Hecate's wreath of snakes gave a spiteful hiss. <laughs> and Hecate heartily wished herself back in her cave. But as for Ceres, she was too earnest in her grief either to know or care whether Phoebus smiled or frowned. Phoebus, exclaimed she, I am in great trouble and have come to you for assistance. Can you tell me what has become of my dear child Persephone? Persephone, Persephone did you call her name? Answered Phoebus, endeavoring to recollect for there was such a continual flow of pleasant ideas in his mind that he was apt to forget what had happened no longer than yesterday. Ah, yes, I remember her now. A very lovely child indeed. I'm happy to tell you, my dear madam, that I did see the little Persephone not many days ago. You may make yourself perfectly at ease about her. She is safe and in excellent hands. Oh, where is my dear child, cried Ceres, clasping her hands and flinging herself at his feet. Why, said Phoebus, as he spoke, he kept touching his lyre so as to make a thread of music run in and out among his words. As the little damsel was gathering flowers, and she has really a very exquisite taste for flowers, she was suddenly snatched up by King Pluto and carried off to his dominions. I have never been in that part of the universe, but the royal palace, I am told, is built in a very noble style of architecture and of the most splendid and costly materials. Gold, diamonds, pearls, and all manner of precious stones will be your daughter's ordinary playthings. 
I recommend to you, my dear lady, to give yourself no uneasiness. Persephone's sense of beauty will be duly gratified, and even in spite of the lack of sunshine, she will lead a very enviable life. Hush, say not such a word, answered Ceres indignantly. What is there to gratify her heart? What are the splendors you speak of without affection? I must have her back again. Will you go with me, Phoebus, to demand my daughter of this wicked Pluto? And as we're starting to run a little long here, we'll pause now and continue with this story in the next video. I hope you're enjoying it. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. I love you guys. Bye-bye.